episode focuses on the materials that are vital to Montessori education, as well as the essential characteristics of the materials and their presentation to the children. This is one of the aspects of the Montessori environment. The more complete the Montessori environment, the more beneficial it is for the students who use it. However, in the real world, every class in every Montessori school can't always meet that ideal from the beginning. Adults who set up and lead a Montessori class must decide how to make the best use of their budget. Though I believe materials Dr. Montessori used in the schools in which she developed her ideas are usually the best choice, I also believe that Montessori educators need to test and evaluate newer materials that are based on concepts developed by Maria Montessori and other educational innovators. Let's look a little closer at the idea of isolating the new concept or the challenge or the potential difficulty in the work that the child's going to do. Here we have two different materials that are obviously about letters. The sounds of the letters are what is being implied because even in this puzzle we have the letter here and we have the object that begins with it. So the implied intent of this material is that the beginning sound of fish and this symbol are going to be associated. How well does that work? Well, now we do have a little, a nice little control of error there. It looks like it would be impossible for me to put the A in where it doesn't belong, but how well have we isolated the difficulty? One of the things that, one ex an experience that pointed this out to me was when I was working with the child with something similar to this and I asked them to find the letter that said J and they didn't move. I said, well, show me the letter that says H. Still didn't move. Show me the letter that says I or I. And they looked at me and they said, well, I see a red and a green and a pink. I don't see any J's or H's or I's. That's where the problem comes when a material doesn't have a clear isolation of difficulty. Is it an eye or is it a pink? So what we have in the Montessori materials is that that distinction is made clearly. Here we see the sandpaper letters, Z, B, and F, that are very clearly nothing other than a Z or a Z, a B or B, an F or F. In the Montessori environment, we usually teach the sounds of the letters before we teach the names because it's most useful in taking the child into the next step of reading. Again, besides the isolation of difficulty in these letters, we have material that fits the child's needs. The letters actually are sand or sandpaper that is included on the board. So when the child touches, they can actually feel where the letter is. In order for this material to work well, we do need the help of a guide because the child would not naturally know the most efficient way to trace the letter. But together with the guide, you then have a well-designed material. It isolates the concept. There is a control of error in that the child actually ha almost is, is compelled to keep their fingers on the shape of the letter because of the smoothness here and the roughness here. And then finally, if each step is presented properly in tracing the letter, the child can successfully learn to do that. In addition to isolating the new concept, controlling the error within the material itself if possible, the third piece is presenting the steps, presenting each step. When the material is presented to the child, one of the things that's most important is to make sure that the child is able to have success. One of the ways that that happens is that the person makes sure that each of the concepts that are taught are taught in steps that the child can understand and that are possible for them to reproduce. So whenever we're working with numerals, it's key that we present things in a way that makes it successful for the child. If all we were working with was 2 and 5 and 10 in the numeral and in the quantity, 
we would want to lay the numerals out first. It's much easier for a child to then pick up the quantity and count it and then check and see whether or not it is indeed two, then it would be for them to look at the 10, have no idea how many, much quantity is present, and try to see whether or not the quantity was correct. So the simple idea that when you're working with the numerical work, you lay out the numbers, you then count the quantity, and match it to the numeral is where the guide is important. When you take the steps in a logical order that makes the success for the child most likely, you are helping the child connect to the environment. Again, the isolation of difficulty, we have no color variation here for the quantity or the numerals. The control of error is obvious in the puzzle pieces that will only fit the correct numeral with the correct quantity. When you're evaluating how you're going to implement the Montessori method with the children that you are teaching, whether it's in the home, in a daycare center, in the school, one of the things that is important is to choose your materials carefully. What you see here are some traditional Montessori materials as well as materials that have, have come a, a little bit later in the progression of, of the Montessori method being developed by those other than Dr. Montessori herself. And the reason that I've got them laid out here the way that I do is to show you some of the genius and the beauty that is built into the materials as well as to help you understand that you do not have to purchase everything that a well-known Montessori manufacturer makes available for the Montessori environment in order to create an effective environment. What you see here are two of the key materials in the sensorial area. The pink tower, or the pink cubes, and a knob cylinder, and then the half of the number puzzles, the numerals from the number puzzles. There are sandpaper numerals that are, are a key part of the, the mathematical area of the Montessori environment, and they could be substituted in the way that I'm going to show you as well. What my point is, is that as long as you have numerals, you may not need to have seven different sets of them in order to work effectively with the Montessori materials. If you can afford the pink tower but can't afford to add the brown stair and the red rods, it is possible to work with the pink tower in a way that introduces some of the same concepts, even though having the full range of sensorial materials is the ideal. As soon as the child has begun to be introduced to the knob cylinders or to the pink stair, they are beginning to be introduced to the base 10 system. 10 cylinders, 10 cubes. In addition, the pink tower is actually set up where there is a difference of one centimeter between the dimensions of each of the cubes. So a way of thinking mathematically is beginning to be introduced to the child as soon as they begin to learn to build the pink tower. We'll talk in a few moments about why the attractiveness of the materials and a complete cycle of work is important in the education of the child. For now, notice that there is a very easy way that correspondences can be made with the numerals. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. You could also set out a numeral and ask the child to give you 10 cylinders. Is it ideal? Not so much, because then of course we have a size difference as well. But it certainly is a way that you can work within the budget that you have to use the Montessori materials in an effective way. One of the reasons that I do believe it's worthwhile to get some of the particular exact Montessori materials is because of the way of thinking that they bring out in the child, the way that they help the child to begin to think mathematically and think in regard to scale. Again, other aspects of the materials are key because of the way that they can develop the child's attention. When you teach the child to replace the cylinder without making any sound at all, you're teaching them one of the most important skills there is, and that is simply to pay full attention with all of their senses.
the environment for the child needs to be inviting from the general environment down to the individual materials that the child is going to be using to learn. The Montessori Pink Tower is a very inviting material. Now if we were working in a Montessori school, we would be on a rug and the child would have brought the Pink Tower to the rug one cube at a time. This allows them to be using many senses to understand with their whole being what each of these cubes is about to sense the size with their hands as well as their eyes, with the visual sense, with the tactile sense of feeling the size within their hand, with the baric sense, the sense of weight and feeling the, different, um, the difference in the cubes as they become larger, that the weight becomes heavier. But probably the reason that this material is so attractive is the idea of the cycle of completion that you are creating something, you're building something. That's why it's the pink tower, not just pink cubes. And once the child has brought the pink tower one cube at a time to their rug, then they bring the base. And then they're able to reconstruct what was so interesting to them to begin with. Now, if we were doing a lesson, there, I, I'll, I'll walk through the way that that would happen. There are really only maybe three or four different categories of types of lessons that are done in the Montessori environment. Generally what happens is the teacher has the child get the material off the shelf and then one of a few different sequences happens. The first sequence is what I'm going to show now which is simply I take a turn and then they repeat what I have done. So even though the child has brought the pink tower to the rug, I would now build the tower and then unbuild it and then give them a turn. The key is how providing just enough information, just enough input to help the child. I'm going to place the bottom cube exactly in the center of the base. I'm going to make sure I have the same amount of space at each corner. When I place the next cube, I'm going to make sure I have a rim all the way around. By the time I got to the 10th cube, you were pro probably pretty ready for that tower to be built. A three-year-old would be having a very different experience. One of the keys with the Montessori method is looking at where the child's attention is. If the child is losing interest, then you need to make a change. But where and when the child loses interest is probably going to be very different than when you do. It would have probably been more interesting to you if I had given a run in, running commentary as I built the tower. It would not be more interesting to the child. The child is more interested in watching and actually feeling the construction that's happening by just being in that experience rather than attempting to listen to what I'm saying and watch what I'm doing at the same time. This isn't a material that would be probably introduced to a, a, a normal a child with normal development at the age of five or six, the first introduction would be when a child was three or maybe four, and possibly two. So the kind of presentation that you give needs to fit where that child is. Later on, other additional extensions are, are brought into the tower. One of the things that's key, however, is don't be too quick to show the child everything you know how to do with the material or everything you can think of to do. The child will then naturally begin to explore the material on its own. When I teach a child, when I give a child a presentation with the pink tower, pretty much what I want to let them know is how they can use it. Can they knock the tower down? No. 
because this is a learning material and it's used during work time can they throw the cubes at other friends no and i wouldn't even mention something like that there would be no reason to by just the way i carefully use the cubes or then when i show them an extension such as taking the little cube and moving it all the way around one of those rims that I so carefully made sure <laughs> were in place. That wouldn't be a problem in a Montessori presentation because it's important for the child to know that it sometimes takes several repetitions to be able to do what you want to do. If I were to show the child that that's the way that I work with the tower, the other rules would not be necessary. Now because the child will learn that they could work with the pink tower in conjunction with the brown stair and other things, there's rules like you can only build things as high as your head that are worthwhile rules to give the child. Because using the material completely carefully and appropriately, they might try to build something higher than their head. And with some of the larger pieces of the dimensional materials, that could be a safety issue. So I want to give the child a model of using things the right way and I only want to give them the restrictions that are really necessary to keep them safe and to keep them treating material with respect when they use it. Another concept that is related to the way that the child's mind works and isolation of a new concept that is very important in the Montessori environment is the idea of when you are teaching a child of co a concept, you use materials that m take the child from the most concrete understanding of the concept to the most abstract. What you see here is the golden bead material that is one of the famous Montessori math materials. Now, the most concrete aspect of a numeral is its quantity. To be able to actually move around discrete pieces or discrete objects that you can count as a quantity. The most abstract way to consider that quantity is through the numerals. We're going to talk about the way that the Montessori materials, as well as some materials that have been developed since Montessori's death, can be used to help that the child make that um, journey from the concrete to the abstract. The passage to abstraction is one way to refer to it. We'll refer to this when we talk about the language area, um, also where it, that it is also key for the child's successful learning. What you see here is a representation of units or ones, tens, hundreds, and thousands. And the reason that this is such a beautiful material is because you literally are taking the quantity that it is and adding to it as concept and quantity. So besides there being 10 individual beads here that the child can count, it, the child is also now able to pick this up and see it as not only 10 pieces, but also as a 10. The same thing is true of the hundred. There are literally 100 beads in this piece, but it also is a hundred that can be held and manipulated as a separate object. And indeed, if you were to look with a flashlight inside of this cube, you would find that there are indeed 1,000 cubes, excuse me, 1,000 beads that are present that actually make up the thousand cube. This is one of the most beautiful Montessori materials, both in aesthetics as well as in concepts. The reason that they're beads is because Montessori was a practical woman. At the time that she was creating her materials, there was a glass factory nearby. And glass beads, these are plastic reproductions that are much easier to produce and thus are more economical than their glass counterparts, but that is the reason why glass beads were originally used for this material. Now here, you see quite a jump into abstraction. These are numerals. But even there, it is not as abstract as simply writing them down on paper. The reason being that even the numerals address the child's need to use movement. And they are designed so the way that a zero disappears 
in a quantity such as 1,111 can be represented in a way that the child can manipulate and move around. In addition to the Montessori Golden Bead materials, there are many other materials from other manufacturers that are useful in helping the child make the passage from concrete quantities to the abstract use of symbols. One of the reasons that the Montessori Golden Bee material is so lovely is because the child can actually take out the materials and count them individually. Besides the hundred being represented as a square, there is actually a hundred chain where the square has been broken apart into the ten bars that the child can count either by individual beads or by the tens. And there is even a thousand chain that allows the child to do the same thing with the quantity of a thousand. There is some research that shows that people who actually are able to think in, in a, a gifted way, mathematically, conceive of tens, hundreds, and thousands as lines, squares, and cubes. Now, once the child has made enough of a passage to abstraction that they're able to begin to use the symbols, at least with movable cards, and have a sense in their hands of the weight of a thousand versus the weight of a hundred, I actually prefer to use a newer material as the child begins to work in operations, uh, begins to do things like carrying and borrowing in, in their operations, and that is the Mortensen math material. You can see here that the hundred is still a square. There is not a thousand cube, although when you stack up ten hundred squares you have a cube of a thousand. The ten is a bar with ten individual units on it that can be counted out. There are individual units, and there are also units that are blocks that represent several units at once, so that the child can begin to work on the idea that each one can be counted individually, but that a four is a separate quantity as well. I prefer the Mortensen materials as the children begin to manipulate the numbers in the decimal system and actually do operations with them. Now, in addition to the Mortensen materials, there's another material that was not directly based on the Montessori materials. However, being a math manipulative, it is based on Montessori. Because most, if not all, math manipulatives have Montessori roots. These are the Unifix cubes, and I also find them to be very, very useful for many different aspects of operations. Now, you'll notice something is different here than in the number puzzles. The isolation of difficulty is not present in that this could be a four or a yellow. The reason that it's not present here anymore is because this material is introduced later. Until the child has a clear sense of the quantity of two and its association to the numeral of two, the quantity of seven and its association to the numeral of seven, this material wouldn't be introduced. But this is, has got a very nice control of error as the child is checking their work, only a four will fit in the four rack. And it is useful to actually have the different quantities coded with different numbers so that a child, when they begin to do adding or other operations, can quickly grab a blue five or a red three. I also like to use these materials in sets of ten, especially in the classroom with the older children, where the materials are always set out in this fashion. A 10 is always set up with five of one color and five of another color because the more that the child can begin to think in mathematical ways that are efficient, the easier it will be for them to not only master things like mathematical operations but find them enjoyable and a jumping off point for even more analytical thinking. One of the reasons that I like the Unifix cubes so much is that they, without a word being said, represent the idea that five is five units, but it is also a thing in and of itself. This is a five 
which consists of five pieces. That is the reason that I think that the Unifix cubes are so valuable. When you use math manipulatives that help the children to think in ways that are effective mathematical representations inside their head, that is what you're giving them effective mathematical representations inside their head. The absorbent mind through the hand absorbs the weight and the shape as well as the concept of a thousand, a hundred, a ten, and a unit. The hand is in direct connection with man's soul and not only with the individual soul, but also with the different ways of life that men have adopted on the earth in different places and at different times. The skill of man's hand is bound up with the development of his mind, and in the light of history, we see it connected with the development of civilization. Maria Montessori in The Absorbent Mind, page 153.